Good evening, I wanna welcome all of you to the Library of Princeton Theological Seminary for a thought-provoking and timely presentation on faith and modern political life. I'm honored to introduce Nancy Gibbs as our speaker this afternoon. Nancy is an award-winning journalist and presidential historian. She currently serves at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University as the visiting Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice of Press, Politics, and Public Policy. She spent three decades of her career at Time Magazine. She's written more cover stories for Time than any writer in the magazine's 100-year history. I first met Nancy several years ago at the Chautauqua Institution, where I had the privilege of listening to her speak. And while my mind was caught up with the wonderful ideas she was presenting, in the back of it was, I have got to get her to Princeton Seminary. <laughs> her lecture tonight is entitled, Trust, Truth, and Trauma. Is Forgiveness Politically Possible? Please join me in welcoming Nancy Gibbs. Thank you, President Barnes. Um, I'm especially honored to be here because this seminary has played such an important role in my own spiritual and intellectual education, albeit indirectly. I grew up in the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church under Bryant Kirkland and Tom Toole and now Scott Black Johnson. And when we moved to Connecticut, I had the good fortune to join a congregation led by Nathan Hart, another of your alums. And so all the way through my journey growing up, the teachings and the beliefs and the priorities and the explorations of this seminary were somehow traveling along with me as I explored um, my world of politics and of journalism and of our public discourse. I come to you not as a clergy, certainly, or scholar, but as storyteller. And I assigned myself this topic because I wanted to be forced to think about it, and I knew I wouldn't, like all journalists, unless I had a deadline. <laughs> uh, and yet, while President Barnes gave me plenty of time to do my homework, I realized that I still feel like I accidentally have ended up in the advanced class, for which I am not prepared. So with that in mind, I'm gonna offer you a few ideas, and then I would like us to have a conversation about this moment that we find ourselves in, in our country's life, as fellow citizens and as fellow explorers. Uh, like many of you, when anytime I need something men mental or physical or spiritual, I know just where to go, Amazon. <laughs> I asked Amazon about the latest thinking on forgiveness. Uh, I found what you might expect, books like The Power of Forgiveness, A Guide to Healing and Wholeness, Radical Forgiveness, The Miracle of Forgiveness, and then, inevitably, forgiveness made easy. <laughs> of course, it never really is, is it? It's hard to let go of anger. Unalloyed fury can be so much more satisfying and nourishing. It makes us feel superior and righteous. It binds us to others who are allied against whatever foe we have chosen. Anger makes us feel alive and alight, like a fighter's bald fist or a runner's crouch, ready to spring at any moment. Sympathy is so soft, so much more muted and liquid, and it's delivered typically in the form of listening, not yelling, not judging, not dismissing or despising. We're taught to be slow to anger, to not let the sun go down on our wrath, that anger resides in the lap of fools. But it feels right now like anger has somehow slipped its bonds and is running loose across our platforms and our press and our politics and even our most private encounters. And the further it travels, the stronger it grows. Some evidence of this. So NBC News asked people whether they felt the country was coming together or coming apart. 80% of people said that we are more divided than we have ever been. 
One in six Americans reports that they have stopped talking to a family member since the 2016 election. Social networks that were designed to bring people together, they gave a whole new meaning to the word friend, have instead uh, turned out to be designed really brilliantly to create enemies and to spur outrage. A Wall Street Journal poll found that people think social media does more to divide us than to unite us by significant majorities. 67% of people say that their side loses in politics more than it wins. Now do the math. <laughs> we know that's not mathematically possible, but we also know that that is spiritually and emotionally possible, that that is what people experience. It's a testimony to this abiding bitterness that people feel about the landscape that they find themselves operating in. The president held a rally last month in Dallas. Uh, one of the warm-up acts, who was the Texas lieutenant governor, introduced him this way. He said, liberals are not our opponents. They're our enemy. That was mirroring descriptions of the president's supporters who were derided as deplorables, fascists, knuckle-draggers, Christian Sharia. We face adversaries that look to weaponize this name-calling, this hostility. One Russian troll from the Internet Research Agency uh, put it this way, he said, our goal wasn't to turn Americans towards Russia. Our task was to set Americans against their own government, against each other, to provoke unrest and discontent. America, you could say, is a story of coming apart and coming together. Born of a revolution fought against what is now our closest ally, rent by civil war, serially splintered over all kinds of issues on the way to, to trying to make America better. So you might say we've always been divided. You might even say that even experimenting with the idea of an ethnically, racially, spiritually heterogeneous society was a long shot. You could say that human beings were designed to form into tribes, into relatively small, relatively homogeneous groups that protect one another and reinforce one another and make the world sensible. And you could say that as too many churches and bowling leagues and rotary clubs and even shopping malls are challenged to keep their cohering power, that it becomes much easier for us all to just retreat into our social media filter bubbles and allow politics to define just about everything. For too many people, partisan politics has become the church that we belong to. Now, the Pew Research Center did this extraordinary survey about what divides us. And they looked at 10, what we would consider 10 political issues, how you feel about immigration, national security, the responsibility of alleviating poverty, uh, the environment, and they asked people to, to express their views on each of those issues. And they found, since they started doing this back in the 1990s, that the amount that people disagreed based on their age, their race, their gender, their level of education, their uh, frequency of attending religious services, and their party affiliation, all stayed fairly steady, that there would be sort of this fairly steady 10 to 15 point gap across all of those measures. In the last three years, that chart has exploded. All those differences around race, gender, religion, income levels are still at that same 10 to 15% gap. The gap on partisan identification is 36 points. We no longer define ourselves by anything as much as we define ourselves by whether we identify with the red team or the blue team. And here's the funny thing about that. Uh, this isn't even about political parties. Institutionally, the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party are in some ways weaker than they've ever been. Nor is this about issue positions. This is not actually specifically about how strongly you agree or disagree with, with issues around gun control or putting a tax on carbon or allowing school vouchers. 
The most surprising thing about the increase in partisanship is that it isn't really about anything other than more partisanship. It's as if our emotional identification with one team or the other is driving ideology rather than the other way around. The University of Maryland professor Liliana Mason calls this ideologues without issues. She says, you feel strongly that you were either on the red team or the blue team without actually knowing or caring that much what positions you therefore hold. The way Sean Westwood at Dartmouth puts this is that in order to have an understanding of the ideology of your party and of the opposed party, you have to have a lot of information and that is something that just doesn't happen to, with, for the majority of the electorate. But if you just believe that your side is good and the other side is bad, then this helps explain why, for one thing, we are seeing politicians much more freely changing their positions on issues. As long as they are loyal to the team, there is no penalty for that. If they are disloyal to the team, just ask Mitt Romney what happens. It's why politicians with high personal disapproval ratings can still easily get reelected because so many people are not voting for them in the first place. They're voting against the person on the other side. Now, even as political identity detaches from issues, it attaches to everything else. I wouldn't have chosen political forgiveness as a topic if this were just about the positions that we take on what are appropriate tax rates or what is the best approach to universal health coverage. We are not just divided about issues. We're divided about everything. We're divided about football. We're divided about late night comedy. We're divided about food. When the people who've made the Impossible Burger the marvelous carnivore fooling new plant-based burger, were instructing retailers about how to market it. They said, don't call it vegan or vegetarian. That would be polarizing. Call it plant-based, because there's nobody who doesn't like plants. <laughs> right? The challenge of political forgiveness is paramount, paramount because this is not just about politics. This is about everything, about how we live and where we live. And this is another part of the challenge. We have actually literally sorted ourselves into comfort zones. More than 61% uh, of voters in 2016 cast ballots in counties where either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump won more than 60% of the vote. Only 10% of the more than 3,000 counties in this country were decided by 10 points or fewer. The vast majority of us live in landslide counties. And we can go to a PTA meeting or a coffee shop or the movie theater or the soccer game and never cross paths with someone who doesn't think the way we do. If our um, experiences aren't just in politics, they aren't just experienced as disagreement. Increasingly, they're experienced as disgust, as contempt. Now, those of you who have a lot of experience with pastoral care know that the most surefire predictor of divorce is when contempt enters into a relationship. Couples can fight and thrive. It's how you fight. And when you start demeaning the other person's worth and dignity, when you sneer and are snide, when you treat them with contempt, those are the hardest relationships to heal. Social scientists uh, talk about something called motive attribution asymmetry. This refers to the idea that I am motivated by love and goodwill and you are motivated by hate and corruption or bigotry. Well, that kind of takes debate and negotiation and compromise off the table, doesn't it? 
This isn't about finding common ground if you're convinced that the person on the other side of that negotiating table actually poses a risk to your community or to the country. Calls for civility are scorned as weak, as unilateral disarmament, if the other side is not just to be disagreed with, but destroyed. The vast majority of people who, who embrace this asymmetry of motive says that they don't like the other side because they think they are a risk to the country. My colleague at Harvard, Arthur Brooks, has written a lot about this in this extraordinary book, Love Your Enemies, where he talks about how contempt operates on our, our bodies and our psyches, as well as our souls. Treat people with contempt, they feel rejected, it leads to depression. Uh, and one Harvard conflict resolution specialist, Donna Hicks, who has studied the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, has said that neuroscientists who track the impact of contempt on people is that the body responds to it in the same way it responds to a physical threat. We respond to threats to our dignity in the same way physiologically that we respond to physical threats to our safety. So I often ask people uh, to ask themselves the hard question of whether in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, in the last week, have you thought about people wherever you sit on the political divide? Have you thought something, said something, tweeted something that is derisive about the other side? And however legitimate you thought your grievance was, what would it have taken for you not to do that? And what price would you feel that you pay in your personal honor to not denounce and call out the opponents that you think are dangerous? Because both sides are viewing their opponents this way. We are hearing from some presidential candidates who are arguing that if we don't get past this, if we don't figure out a way to once again elevate the very possibility and value of some kind of unity, some kind of compromise and collaboration, it is not going to be possible as a country for us to get anything done. The way Pete Buttigieg put it was this. He said, the real question of leadership is not, do we round up all of the good people, hope it's more than 51%, come together and crush the bad people? It's, are we going to bring out what's better in us? versus what is worse than us. Now, there are so many reasons that we want to get out of this very polarizing moment in our public life that you have to ask, why is that so hard? And that goes beyond mere human nature, beyond the fact that sharing an enemy often makes us less lonely, and that this speaks to holes in our hearts and holes in our homes, and there is certainly that. There is also, however, in a way that was not nearly as technologically powered in the past as it is now, an extraordinarily powerful outrage industrial complex. There is a lot of money to be made on making and keeping people angry. It raises money for candidates. It raises money for activist groups. And now we have come in our service for a moment of confession. It is very much in the business model of media. A lot of news organizations, a lot of publications in print, online, television networks have found that it is extremely profitable to make people angry and keep them angry. The algorithms that shape so much of what you see and share and consume light up when you're mad and are engineered to keep you that way. I was uh, happy to be reminded that it was actually uh, the Apostle Paul who was the first to spot the dangers of cognitive bias and filter bubbles. Second Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, 
They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. We wander off into the myths that conform with what we want to believe and tell us what we already know and make us feel better and smarter. And so what would it take to come together now and to forgive each other our many sins? When we talk about political forgiveness, we usually are talking about its public expression. It will be a leader or a legislature that uh, offers an initiative to, in the spirit of repentance over slavery, over the treatment of indigenous peoples. Australia has a sorry book where citizens can record their remorse over a government policy that used to remove Aboriginal children from their families. Part of this is about what countries need to do in order to move forward. Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, which was an act of both individual and public forgiveness, because, he said, my conscience tells me it is my duty not merely to proclaim domestic tranquility, but to use every means I have to ensure it. He believed that the country in the wake of Watergate could not move forward, could not accomplish any of its urgent needs without this act of forgiveness, knowing that it would very well and probably did cost him any chance of being reelected to the office in 1976. It was interesting to me that it fell to another family 27 years later to honor the courage that that act of forgiveness took when the Kennedys gave Gerald Ford their Profiling Courage Award which was essentially one presidential family forgiving another for pardoning a third. On his first day in office, Jimmy Carter um, announced an amnesty for hundreds of thousands of Vietnam draft evaders, an act of political forgiveness because he believed that the country could not move forward. And it's easy for us to forget now in the midst of the furors around us of just how divided the country was around Vietnam, how divided it was around Watergate. In those cases, um, you could argue that forgiveness had a strategic, even potentially cynical edge to it. He who forgives first wins. It's a competitive advantage. That's different than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that is much more intimate, much more one-on-one, -on -one, about the families and the friendships that have been damaged and the discourse that has been poisoned by how we as individuals navigate this current political environment. What will it take to reconcile these deep personal differences that are expressed in ever more virulent ways? Well, I'm encouraged by the work of a group called More in Common who, as its name suggests, has as its mission to build more united, inclusive, and resilient societies in which people believe that what they have in common is greater than what divides them. Their research finds that 93% of people are tired of how divided we've become. 89% of people are looking for leaders who are prepared to restore the possibility and priority of compromise. And so in good Presbyterian fashion, I'm going to suggest three things that I think will help with that, and then you all are going to add to those. The first is clarity, the second is complexity, and the third is humility. So clarity first. Uh, that more in common survey found that three quarters of people say they don't identify with the extremes on either side. We're fighting about guns. Three quarters of people believe in the need for stronger gun control legislation. We're fighting about immigration. About three quarters of people also believe in a path to citizenship for the children um, of undocumented aliens. Wait, you say, how can that be when we're so polarized around these issues? And the answer is, remember, we are not as polarized as the issues as we just are around our partisan identities. We love our team. We don't like the other team because we think they're a threat to the country. 
more than 90% of both Republicans and Democrats describe people on their own side as honest, reasonable, and caring. And they describe people on the other side as brainwashed and hateful. And that's the trick. We don't identify as holding extreme views, but we misperceive that our opponents do. And so there has been fascinating research about what that looks like, how dramatically. On average, people believe that 55% of their opponents hold extreme views when fewer than a third actually do. That is a recipe for misunderstanding and therefore division based on a lack of clarity about what people truly believe. So Democrats, for instance, misunderstand Republicans most on immigration by like a 33 point gap where uh, that Republicans actually think that a properly controlled immigration system is good for the country. Most Democrats think that most Republicans don't believe that. Most Democrats also think that most Republicans believe that racism and sexism is no longer a problem. That is not what most Republicans believe. The same is true the other way. Most Republicans believe that uh, Democrats, by and large, think all police are bad, that the US should have open borders and be a socialist economy. Most Democrats don't believe that. And so as scholars find that people tend to dramatically overestimate um, the extremism of beliefs on the other side, it of course drives the perception that the other side poses a risk to the country. And they find that when people acquire a more accurate clear vision of the values and the judgments and the belief of the other side, that, the, ex that the, the hostility and the intensity tends to drain out of the, the conversation. Where does the perception gap come from? Another confession, it comes from media. Because the group that had the smallest misunderstanding of the other side, like just a two point misunderstanding, was the group that reported it consumed very little. Very little news, didn't watch the news, didn't watch TV. And of course the groups that had the largest perception gaps, not surprisingly, are the ones that were most likely to be tuned into the most partisan news sources. This is not an argument for turning off the TV and canceling your subscriptions and getting all of the newsletters out of your inbox. It is an argument for media literacy and for us to be very deliberate in understanding um, what is being communicated. And I think there should be a price that public leaders should pay for intentionally dividing, intentionally caricaturing, intentionally for their own political ends. And when I say public leaders, I mean not just in politics, but in any sphere of public life if they are contributing to the misperception, if they are clouding our understanding of one another, they are doing active damage to our ability to function as a society. And I believe there should be a price to be paid for that. This is not sport. This is not entertainment. This has genuine, very serious consequences. I'm heartened by the fact that uh, Steven Pinker, in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, suggested that the printing press actually contributed to um, our ability to empathize with one another, to read one another's stories, to walk in one another's shoes. And so maybe in an ideal world, the, the dangers that we are increasingly aware of that social media poses to us, the inverse can also be true if even technology becomes a means for us to get to know one another better and more accurately. And this points now to my second point about complexity. Among the many cognitive biases that we all carry around is a binary bias that we tend to see things in black and white. Once again, media often feels like it is our job as storytellers to make things simpler. In fact, the imperative right now is to make things more complicated. To break us away from a black and white, us and them, red and blue, simplified understanding of our world so that all of the grays, all the other dimensions can enter in. 
How do we know this works? Here's how we know. Uh, researchers gave a group of people um, a set of policy initiatives, like do you think that we should have merit pay for teachers? Do you think that um, there should be uh, a single payer healthcare system? And asked people to rate on a scale of one to 10 how intensely they agreed or disagreed with that position, having registered the intensity of their beliefs. They then said, okay, how would that work? Tell me how you would implement merit pay. Tell me how you would make it fair and equitable, how you would fund it. Uh, tell me how a single payer, single payer system would affect the delivery of health care and would it lead to rationing and start drilling down into the actual details of any of the policy positions. And it won't surprise you that most people can't go very many levels below, I believe in this, I don't believe in that. That's not what was important. What was important was then when they then went back and said, how intensely do you support these positions? Well, they were suddenly much less certain. An encounter with complexity um, ended up draining some of the anger, some of the fury, some of the certainty out of people's positions. In other words, you could say that an intellectually humbling experience of not being able to explain very well something they believed adamantly led to a softening of the lines of division. And these, so these first two prescriptions of clarity and complexity complement each other, right? If we, once we see each other more clearly, we see that we are complicated people that we tend to hold a mix of views, that we weight our values in subtle and important ways that shape the way we engage with the world. And so seeing one another more clearly allows us to appreciate the complexity that we each bring. And so that, of course, leads me naturally to the third and most urgent need, which is for humility. That means holding your beliefs and values both strongly and gently, open to the possibility that the things you're certain of can still be wrong. This is not an argument for moral relativism. This is not an argument for situational ethics. This is not an argument that there is no such thing as things being true. It is simply that we are human and we are fallen and none of us has perfect knowledge. We are creative creatures who can keep learning. This is the whole premise of the scientific method, that you be open to new evidence, that you can refine your hypotheses as new evidence becomes available to you, which requires a constant condition of humility in order for that to work. Once you stop believing that you might possibly be wrong, you might possibly have something else to learn, well, then you're no longer exploring. You're just standing still with your eyes closed and your hands over your ears, which is not where we need to be as a country right now. It is always wise to seek the truth in our opponent's error, Niebuhr said, and the error in our own truth. So we know that we can't hope to change hearts and minds without empathy. The oldest gospel in politics is that uh, they don't care what you think unless they think that you care. And it is very hard to express that kind of caring without a spirit of radical humility guiding you. We clearly need better ways to get to know each other and not just virtually. The idea that more exposure to people with different points of view is an intuitively attractive one, except it turns out it really matters what that exposure looks like. Researchers have actually found that exposing people to their opponents' views on Twitter just makes them angrier. That doesn't work. This has to be direct and sustained and in person and in pursuit of common purpose, which seems like a really excellent mission for our churches to really dig into in all sorts of ways, not just within their communities, but in bringing together disparate communities and exposing people to people and ideas that will surprise them 
And the very act of being surprised reminds us again that we are learning. Leadership is going to come from uncountable individual decisions to model kindness and to lift up the stranger and to get offline and into the streets and the classroom and the sanctuary and help people in trouble. Culture changes and politics changes one heart and mind at a time. And I don't want it to take another massive national tragedy like 9-11 to confront us with our shared humanity and how much more we love each other than we hate each other. But we do need a culture, including a media culture, that covers our commonality as well as our conflicts. We need to reward leaders not just for what they fight for, but how they fight. We need to seek out strangers to connect with and tell our stories. Because we are a country on a pilgrimage. This is a journey with purpose to a destination seeking the divine, and it feels right now like we have lost our way. Be the people who draw the maps, who model not just mere civility, but active, courageous kindness, who forswear the snobbery of certainty, and who honor the Prince of Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you.